the candor of Jesus. If it were not so, I would have told you. John 14, 2. The word candor has a modern meaning. In the past, it meant whiteness or brightness, coming from the Latin word candidus, which means white. This is where we also get the word candidate, which refers to someone dressed in white, as ancient Roman office seekers wore white togas. However, in modern language, candor means being open, fair, honest, and sincere. It is a rare and attractive virtue. Some people do not possess it. They are quiet, reserved, and keep their thoughts and emotions hidden. When they say something, it is hard to tell how much they mean because we don't know their true feelings. When they take action, we can't predict their next move because we don't know what is in their heart. They don't fully open up to anyone. These people may be respected and admired, but they cannot be loved. Jesus, on the other hand, was loved intensely to the point that people were willing to die for him. One of the reasons for this was because he had an open heart. We can learn about a person's character by looking at the people they admire and praise. The qualities they sincerely like in others are likely to be a part of their own character. In the Gospel of John, Jesus praised a man named Nathanael. Nathanael was from a small village called Cana in Galilee, near Nazareth. When Philip met Jesus, he was eager to introduce him to his friend Nathanael. Excitedly, Philip said, We have found him, to which Nathanael responded with a cold remark, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Cana and Nazareth were neighboring villages and often had a negative opinion of each other. Even in larger cities, there can be bitter rivalries between competing towns. Nathanael had a strong dislike for Nazareth and expressed his skepticism, but his friend did not give up and calmly said, Come and see. Surprisingly, Nathaniel accepted the invitation without being held back by his preconceived notions and prejudices. He was willing to investigate for himself, showing an open mind and sincere heart. Jesus had been impressed by Nathaniel's genuine and noble face when he saw him praying under a fig tree. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he exclaimed with praise, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. This kind of person immediately won Jesus' heart. Nathaniel had no craftiness or cunning, no deceit or dishonesty. He was sincerely open, and Jesus felt a connection with souls free from deceit. This is why Jesus always spoke highly of having a childlike disposition. Without a childlike heart, one cannot enter heaven. Why? Because a child's heart is always open. Where else can you find such honesty, frankness, and sometimes surprising outspokenness as in a child? They will tell you exactly what they think and feel, holding nothing back. Their genuine self-revelation can melt and touch your heart. This is one reason why Jesus placed a child among his disciples, saying, This is the kind of person you should aspire to be, because a child embodies and represents candor. A person reveals themselves not only through their likes, but also through their dislikes. Whom did Jesus dislike the most? The Pharisees. He held them in contempt and scorn. On one occasion in Jerusalem, he called them vipers to their faces. It was a strong word, but it accurately depicted the true nature of these individuals. They were as venomous and deadly as snakes. It is a terrible thing to tarnish the name of God, make religion detestable, and poison the hearts of people. Yet, these hypocrites were doing exactly that. Their deceitful actions and behavior stirred up blazing anger in the genuine and open-hearted Jesus. He never hesitated to speak the truth when it was necessary. His caring heart guided him to know when the right moment had arrived. At a wedding celebration in Cana, his mother approached him with pleading eyes and a desperate plea for help to resolve a troubling situation. He responded, Why are you involving me, woman? It had been foretold that Mary would experience great sorrow, and this was one of those moments. The time had come when the wishes of his mother could no longer control his actions. Her persistent requests could no longer determine what Jesus would do. The days in Nazareth were gone, and a new chapter in Jesus' life had begun, where a mother was just a woman whose thoughts and desires had to be secondary to the will of the man she had called her son. We can only imagine the pain Jesus felt in speaking those words. But he was a man with an open heart, and he had to speak the painful truth. The Gospels are filled with examples of this surprising and bold honesty. On one occasion, he confronted the Sadducees, 
who were representatives of the influential and wealthy classes in Palestine, and told them directly that their ignorance was causing them to make mistakes. They lacked knowledge of both the scriptures and the power of God. It was a necessary word, as sometimes people who know very little and think they know a lot can benefit from being reminded of their limitations. However, delivering such reprimands is not an easy task. Jesus attempted to heal some of the weaknesses in people through his straightforwardness. His sense of fairness is evident in his warnings to both the twelve disciples and those who wanted to follow him. He held nothing back. The full truth, no matter how terrible, had to be revealed. No one could become his disciple without knowing the risks and dangers that discipleship entailed. Read the tenth chapter of Matthew as an example of his openness. He wanted the twelve to carry out his work, but before they began, they needed to understand what experiences they might encounter. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves, he warned them, using a metaphor that the men would understand well. He continued to paint a bleak picture that could discourage even the bravest, and the only encouragement he could offer them in facing such dreadful dangers was the promise that he would acknowledge them before his Father in heaven. No disciple could ever say, I didn't know what I was getting into, or question why they hadn't been informed. When people eagerly declared, Teacher, I will follow you, he presented them with the harsh reality, unwilling to accept their allegiance without first revealing the true significance of joining his ranks. Some were filled with dreams of power, authority, and glory, but they were chilled by his piercing question, Can you drink the cup? His straightforwardness may have reduced the number of his followers, but it was his nature to withhold nothing that people had a right to know. However, his candor reached its peak in his confessions. Three of these confessions deserve our attention. He openly admitted that there were limits to his authority. One day, a man interrupted him, pleading, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Who appointed me to be a judge or arbitrator between you? There was a realm in which Jesus was not meant to intervene. It was a surprising confession for the Messiah to make. The prophets had envisioned the Messiah as having authority over all aspects of life, putting an end to injustices and establishing justice. The nation had longed for a king who would bring an end to the cruel inequalities that plagued the world and administer justice fairly. Yet here, the Messiah turned away from a man seeking justice, stating that he couldn't intervene in that situation. Only a strong individual is brave enough to disappoint their friends by honestly admitting that they cannot fulfill their expectations. Jesus not only confessed a limitation of his authority, but also a limitation of his power. When two of his disciples requested to hold prominent positions in his future kingdom, he openly told them that he did not have the power to appoint his own prime ministers because those matters were hidden in God's plans. It was surprising to hear him admit that he didn't know everything. For religious Hebrews, the idea of an ignorant Messiah was impossible to conceive. They believed the Messiah had to possess both the ability to do everything and the knowledge of everything. This belief was shared by the Samaritans, as we can see from the words of the woman from Samaria who said, I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will tell us everything. However, Jesus openly acknowledged that there were things he didn't know. One day, he spoke about the end of the world with such certainty that people assumed he knew exactly when it would happen. To their amazement, he declared, No one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. A teacher's authority with the public is greatly weakened when their ignorance on a subject within their expertise is revealed. Confessing ignorance is a difficult and risky admission for a teacher to make, as it undermines confidence and diminishes authority. Jesus candidly admitted his ignorance, knowing the risks and potential misunderstandings that his words would generate. However, his friends and followers, unlike Jesus, have often hesitated to openly acknowledge his ignorance and attempted to reinterpret his words to downplay their meaning. Some have even tried to interpret Jesus' statement in a way that avoids acknowledging any deficiency in his knowledge fearing that people might hesitate to fully trust him and recognize him as the supreme ruler. 
but those who try to evade the plain language of Scripture are not being honest. We should be grateful that Peter was honest enough to report exactly what Jesus said to Mark, and that Mark was sincere enough to faithfully record it. Even Matthew, who wrote a book specifically to prove that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah and King of Israel, did not shy away from recording Jesus' confession of ignorance regarding the timing of the end of the world. The New Testament, like its protagonist, is refreshingly candid. It boldly proclaims, This is the Messiah, the Son of God, and then it honestly portrays how people spat upon him. Nothing inspires trust in a person like honesty. If someone is open and truthful in most things, we can trust them in the rest. Jesus used his candor as a reason for his disciples to trust him in matters that go beyond their understanding. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He assured them that he would not keep them in the dark about important matters. These disciples already had a deep belief in the afterlife. Like any normal and uncorrupted individuals, they believed that death is not the end and looked forward to a life that is more expansive and joyful than anything this world could offer. Jesus allowed them to hold on to these expectations. He saw the direction their hearts were turned towards, and he didn't tell them it was a mere illusion. He let them continue to think of and hope for heaven, and now that his earthly life was coming to an end, he revealed more about the nature of the vast world that lies just beyond the shadow of death. Keep this in mind as you read the New Testament, and it will strengthen your confidence in many things we believe about Jesus. We believe he was without sin. Why? Because of statements like, which one of you can prove me guilty of sin? However, this foundation may seem somewhat uncertain. Should we believe he was sinless simply because he never committed a sinful act? But how can we know about his thoughts, feelings, and motives? What evidence do we have that his thoughts, feelings, and motives were always in line with God's will? The strongest reason we have for believing in Jesus' sinlessness is the fact that he allowed his closest friends to believe it. In all his teachings, there is no trace of regret, remorse, or sorrow for any shortcomings. He taught others to see themselves as sinners, stating clearly that the human heart is evil. He instructed his disciples to pray for forgiveness, implying that they had sins to confess. Yet, he himself never expressed any personal guilt or remorse. This is amazing, like nothing else. All the saints beat their chests and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The purer the heart, the humbler it becomes before infinite holiness. Jesus never suggests, through his words or actions, that he falls short of God's wishes. If he did, wouldn't he have mentioned it? He was always honest and open. Would he deceive people about something so important? Is it like him to be aware of wrongdoing and feel guilty about his sins, yet never mention the need for forgiveness like the disciples do? They believed he was without sin. Would he, with his honesty and openness, allow his closest friends to be deceived? He was sinless, just as the apostle said he was. We are certain of this, because if he wasn't, he would have told us. Based on his sincerity, we have the right to trust him both in this life and the next. When he says that we will perish if we don't repent and that only those who are born again can enter the kingdom of light, we have every reason to believe these statements are true. And when he says that his disciples will do even greater things than what happened in Palestine and that he will always be with us until the end of the world, why shouldn't we believe him? Since he is so open and honest with us, why shouldn't we be open-hearted and honest with him? If he truly shares what's in his heart, why shouldn't we share what's in ours? He has given himself to us, so why don't we give ourselves to him?